Okay, so, um, you know, as we've already heard uh, in uh, the awards and celebrations already, we're living through uh, such interesting times uh, in the space of technology, education, and higher ed. And I think it's a time when, you know, we feel very optimistic and uh, a, a big sense of promise about the future and how these new technologies can change our teaching practices, uh, can be tied to interesting innovations at the institutional level as well. But I also feel like it's a really important time to sit back and also reflect on what our core values are as educators and those of us who care about higher educational institutions because it's precisely in these moments of change and flux that we're really challenged to hold on to the things that really matter to us most uh, in the face of a very rapidly changing technology and media landscape. So on this note, my uh, in-flight reading on the way home, uh, on the way here uh, from Los Angeles was the recently released uh, Gallup Purdue poll which looked at the long-term outcomes of higher education. I don't know, how many of you saw the coverage of this or read, read about this? Yeah, so a few of you. I mean, this hit my inbox last week and so I took the time on the plane to dig into this a little bit. And what popped out to me, and I think for a lot of people who looked at this report, is the fact that a lot of the things that we traditionally think of as indicators for differentiating the quality of higher educational experiences, like is it a big school, little school, public or private? Is it a highly selective or not so selective school? Those things ended up really not mattering that much for the kinds of long-term outcomes that Gallup was looking at, which are engagement in work and thriving in life, having healthy relationships, uh, feeling a sense of self-efficacy, uh, being connected to others, making meaningful contributions. And what they found is that what really mattered was not those uh, metrics that a lot of times uh, those of us in higher educational institutions are held to, but the actual quality of experiences that young people were getting in their lives on campus. And specifically, the things that really stood out is whether young people had a connection with a faculty member that was personal and meaningful, whether they were inspired by a faculty member, and then the second big piece was whether they were engaged in learning experiences that felt meaningful and relevant to them. And how uh, this shook out concretely was, were they really involved in some extracurricular activities? Uh, what we call in our research interest-driven learning. Was that a part of their experience in college? Uh, did they engage in project-based work that was longer than a semester, so sustained project-based work over time? Uh, were they able to apply what they were learning in class to something in the world at large? These ended up to be huge predictors of whether these same young people were thriving in work and life after college. And I put this out there not because it gives us an answer to how we should be using technology, but just as a reminder of the core values of what we all know to be, be good teaching and educational experiences in the face of a lot of these new opportunities that technology is handing us. <clears throat> it's hard to believe that it hasn't even been three years since uh, Ram and Norvig piloted this crazy open online course that got tens of thousands of students to, uh, to sign up. And in those three years, we've already been through a hype and a you know, bus cycle around MOOCs, and we're still grappling with what's going on. And I think it's really, really important to remember that you know, we're in this cycle of very rapid change and experimentation at the technology layer, but things are still really early. Things are still up for grabs. And what's so great about being in a room of brave souls who are trying things out is that this is the group that's actually going to shape what's going to happen in our educational institutions to come. This is a moment of churn. It's an inflection point where things are changing quickly. It feels like Sometimes the world as we know it is coming to an end. But in fact, we have so much power 
to shape where things going, where things are going. So I also think it's super exciting. So the question that I want to put before you all, and that's really animated the work that I've been doing uh, with the MacArthur Foundation around digital media and learning and connected learning, is really this fundamental question about how uh, young people's environments around it, information, knowledge, social connection have changed, and what as educators, as mentors, as parents, we can do to best support young people's learning and development in an era of information abundance, where there's an abundance of social connectivity. And there's a lot of ways <coughs> that you could address this question uh, of how we adapt our educational practices to the new realities of the network information age. What we've really been focused on with the connected learning work is really saying that the real opportunity here, if we want to push for those more progressive, uh, meaningful kinds of learning experiences for young people is to use this new uh, set of capacities uh, to forge stronger connections between what's happening in the classroom and the world at large. And uh, this is not a new agenda. It's what Dewey talked about as education being seamless with life. But today, with the new technologies, we have an opportunity to realize those progressive long-standing goals of education with new tools that make this kind of uh, hands-on, socially connected, relevant learning much more easily accessible uh, and in a way that is more connected uh, to the educational practices that we're involved in uh, within our institutions of higher education. So I want to talk about this uh, in three parts. First, just talking a bit about the research on young people and new media. So where are kids these days? How are they engaged? And then I'll talk about our model of connected learning that has come out of our ongoing work with young people. And then finally, I'll end with uh, some guiding design principles and a smattering of examples that uh, we're looking towards to sort of help guide our way through this new terrain. <clears throat> Okay, so first a little bit on the quantitative research. I always like to start with the reminder that young people are readers. Uh, in fact, young people under the age of 30 are more likely to have read a book recently than older folks. Uh, so this is Pew Research uh, for libraries, and uh, they're finding that young people are reading books. They read a ton online, and it's not just tweets and text messages. They also read longer form stuff. Uh, and also just to remind us all that young people are actually writers, too. And this is where Andrea Lunsford's work at Stanford, I think, is the most extensive in this area. But she's done research, I think, starting in 2001, a five-year study of Stanford students that showed that the volume of writing has radically expanded uh, and that uh, the quality is comparable to what we've seen in the past. Uh, but the nature of the writing has also changed. So instead of being a more solitary activity, today's writing that young people are engaged in tends to be more collaborative, uh, participatory, and social in nature. And she's done some work uh, outside of Stanford looking across a more diverse range of institutions and has pretty much found the same thing, that the volume of writing has, I think, tripled in the past 25 years or so and the quality by which she's uh, judging things like the error rate, for example, in writing has really not changed that much. Now what has changed is the volume of media that young people are engaged in on an everyday basis. So this is the Kaiser work. It's a few years old now. But they found that uh, 8 to 18 year olds engage in about seven and a half hours of media a day. Now, because they're multitaskers, they manage to cram almost 11 hours of media within that seven and a half hours. So uh, this is what's different, that so much of not only just entertainment and information access, but also social communication mm -hmm. is happening through these mediated channels, that that's really where they are, uh, young people are, and increasingly all of us are, in terms of how we connect with others. Uh, also, just a quick reminder that gaming is the entertainment medium of our time. 
Uh, it's not just geeky teenage boys anymore, it's every age demographic. And so these interactive, immediate feedback type of formats are more and more how we engage with information and knowledge. <coughs> uh, and then finally, uh, just to say that mobile is really where it's at and where it will be at more and more. The US was a little bit late to this party. I've done a lot of research in Japan, which was about 10 years ahead of the curve. I thought that American teenagers were never going to learn uh, to text message. I was wrong. It happened. And when it happens, uh, whether it's East Asia or the US or Northern Europe, it tends to stabilize in this pattern, which is for teen teens, about 100 texts a day for girls and about 50 texts a day for boys. So the volume and the frequency of engagement with media, mobile trumps everything once you have it uh, become the standard of communication. Mm -hmm. So the question for us as faculty, as administrators, as educators, is what happens when these kids walk into the classroom? <laughs> so you have these kids who are used to this constant flow of information. They're always connected with others. And we're in the middle of this culture clash between literally our infrastructures like this, right? And our practices and our assessment that were created in a period of information scarcity and then the reality of what young people are encountering outside of the classroom walls, which is connectivity, information is always there. Uh, you know, they don't need to be sitting like this to have access to information anymore. So how can we start to adapt so that it doesn't become a culture clash, but it can actually be a productive relationship between those environments? So, <laughs> I think it's important to uh, remind ourselves that information abundance, social connectivity, these are good things. But with abundance comes a new set of challenges and strategies that we have to deal with to manage that abundance. And it reminds me of when, as a species, we encountered calorie abundance. And suddenly our strategies for managing scarcity became incredibly counter, uh, counterproductive when calories became cheap and abundant. And we had to adapt a lot of our social norms, our culture, and our institutional practices. I mean, we're still struggling with it to manage that calorie abundance. So for anybody who has Breaking Bad in their Netflix queue, <laughs> anybody who is on a Tumblr blog, these require new strategies for management. And you know, I'm a parent of two teenagers, and I'm super into them being all over the internet and pursuing their interests online, but we struggle every day because they've still got to get those AP exams done. They've still got to get to their music lessons. And there's this abundance of riches just out there of cool stuff, always. So it's this challenge of just saying, you know, lids down, it's time to, um, <clears throat> start developing a new set of competencies, a new set of strategies for managing this information. So I'd like to take the temperature of those of you here in the room just to get a sense of what your feelings are about young people and technology and learning. Uh, if you could show me with your thumbs, uh, where thumbs up is, you feel really positive and optimistic about digital kids these days. These new technologies are helping them uh, become smarter, better, faster. Uh, thumbs down is it's a distraction, they're not able to cope, uh, it's pulling away from the learning and reflection that matters most, and sideways is it's a little bit of both. Where would you put yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I would say a lot of sideways. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm with the sideways too. Uh, you know, it really depends on the kid, on the context, uh, that you know, these technologies can have such varied effects for varied kids at different times. It's like what uh, William Gibson famously said, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> so the reality is that young people do stuff with technology that we might approve of, like 
using Canvas to do peer feedback and study groups, you know, doing a wiki storming uh, project, and a lot of things that are utilizing these new technologies in ways that are connected with the educational practices that we care about. They also do stuff that we might feel a little iffier about, like, you know, maybe they go to Spark Notes rather than read the actual book. Um, and of course, they do the pre screen, right? Check for the professors who are tough graders on ratemyprofessor.com. You know, the proliferation of essay buying and download sites that you're finding on the internet. Uh, and this is my latest favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the reality is that we're living in an era where the flow at the student layer, at the peer-to-peer -peer layer, is so efficient, so seamless now, that you really just can't keep playing whack-a-mole and telling kids not to share, telling kids not to access, you know, that abundance of information that we all know is out there. Uh, so the question is, do we look at this new ecology of peer sharing and lament the fact that it's eroding all of our cherished ways of doing things, or do we look at this new space as an actual opportunity for building on this kind of peer feedback sharing and flow and abundance of information? The problem, you get problems like this when learning is disconnected from meaningful purpose, uh, from real problem solving, from original work, when it's about filling in the blanks, doing assignments that have been done over before, assignments that you can easily farm out to some third party. Uh, so this is the challenge we're facing. Uh, in a lot of ways, this new media environment forces us to reconnect with those things that I think we would all agree are the real value that we provide for students, those personal connections, the meaningful context of inquiry, uh, and so on. Uh, so the, the challenge really is for us to uh, mobilize the new technologies, not uh, in ways that reproduce old systems that were probably not that great to begin with, but really uh, remake some of how uh, we're thinking about our educational practices. So my own research on young people and technology uh, was started you know, about a decade ago in relation to the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative. And we've done a lot of work just hanging out with kids online, uh, looking at video gaming practices, looking at uh, media production practices, digital media production practices. And the research is ongoing, uh, but we, uh, you know, we had one big report that came out and a few years ago, and then since then, we've really been working hard with a group of not just researchers, but of designers and educational practitioners and administrators in thinking about how can we respond to these changing practices of young people in ways that really productively further their learning and development and bring adults, parents, teachers, educational institutions, librarians, mentors into the mix in the most productive ways possible. And that is really the model, the movement around connected learning that we're trying to build. Now, I won't share all of the research results that have come out of our work, but I did want to highlight just a few that have become really salient uh, for this model of connected learning. Uh, one is, uh, this is a headline from our release of the Digital Youth Report, which I think captures uh, one of our core findings, which is that there is a persistent generation gap between how young people value online participation and how older folks do, where young people see the internet as a lifeline to social connectivity, to information and knowledge, and older folks tend to see it as a distraction from learning, uh, and at best, uh, entertainment or uh, social messing around. Now, interestingly enough, even as older folks have really adopted social media, uh, they still tend to see the engagement with those same platforms by young people as a waste of time. So there's a bit of work to do there, and I think the generation gap can really uh, work against that intergenerational connection building that I think is at the heart of where we really want to be. 
Now, the other thing that we found is that young people are using technology in different ways. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of learning going on, but the learning is different depending on the context. So we found that most young people are using online platforms for what we call friendship-driven learning and participation. That, that's the Facebook part. It's Facebook and text messaging. When we were doing our research, it was actually MySpace and instant messaging. So the platforms change, but the behaviors are basically what you see them doing in the cafeteria or the locker room uh, or so on. It's flirting, it's status display, it's friendship, all of that stuff that's happening in that age-segregated pressure cooker that we call the high school peer group. And the technology is changing some of that, but it's also kind of the same. It's not radically different from what young people have been doing for generations. Now, where we see a real difference is what we're calling that interest-driven learning and par participation side of things. And these are the kids who are on Tumblr, they're on, you know, back in the day it was LiveJournal, all of these specialized interest groups that are proliferating around the internet where we find that young people are connecting with others who share a specialized interest, really pushing each other to gain knowledge and expertise. And often, these kinds of communities, uh, these kinds of spaces of knowledge exchange, whether it's a gaming site, whether it's a fan fiction site, whether it's a video production site, uh, they're very different from the peer dynamics at school because uh, having a passionate intellectual, creative, or civic interest is not necessarily high status within most peer groups in a high school. Uh, I think in college, obviously, that starts to shift. But in the online world, you can be really into uh, you know, professional wrestling fan fiction. You may not have a lot of peers in your local community who are into that, but you can just geek out on whatever is your deep and passionate interest. And we find that that is really changing the opportunity equation for a lot of young people in terms of their learning uh, and development. So this has really become an important focus of our work moving forward, <coughs> is to understand this opportunity space. And let me just make it a little bit more concrete through an example. So uh, Dave is a young man who I interviewed uh, as part of my study of online fans of Japanese animation. And he's a web comics creator, and he was, I think it was maybe his second or third year of college. He was in a rural, small college. He stayed for the summer. All of his friends were gone. He was bored. He went on the internet, and then he discovered web comics, and he just fell in love with it, read everything he could, checked out HTML for dummies, uh, took a bunch of online tutorials, and he taught himself how to make web comics and also how to create websites. And he uh, started hosting the websites of other web comics creators. He actually changed his major at school to try to get it more in alignment with this emerging interest. But there wasn't anything really in the curriculum. I mean, this was pretty early days that could really support this interest. So most of his learning he did uh, online through tutorials and open online resources, but also through a social community that he started to engage with of fellow web comic creators who really pushed him to improve his craft. So a few years later, I interviewed him, and he was actually uh, successfully transitioned to having a career as a web comics artist. He had been freelancing, doing web design for a while, but he uh, eventually uh, became a commercially successful artist. And his learning, it, um, if you look at how it developed, he started uh, with a passionate interest. Now, not every young person has that kind of passionate interest, but in Dave's case, this was just his thing. Now, he didn't have anybody in his local community. He didn't have classes at his college that could support that interest. But what he did find was a community online, a very niche community, who was really into the thing that he was into and had the expertise uh, to help him develop his capacity as an artist. And then what made Dave unique and made him different actually from almost all the kids we've talked to was he was able to really go full circle and connect the learning that he was doing in that informal, peer-driven and interest space into uh, career opportunity uh, that um, ended up you know, really 
uh, helping him thrive uh, both economically and personally. So this is what, when we talk about connected learning, this is what we, we mean. It's when a young people person is able to pursue something that he finds meaning, he or she finds meaningful and interesting. That he has, uh, like Dave, a peer group of uh, mentors, other experts, um, and friends who share that interest in a way that's oriented uh, to learning and expertise. And then the part that's the hardest is actually when that learning is connected to uh, opportunity, whether that's in our educational institutions, in our civic institutions, or in terms of career. Now we found many examples of kids, uh, young women and men, like Dave, who were geeking out on stuff, whether it was gaming or One Direction fandom or whatever it is, and they were connecting to online communities of interest that supported these geeked out interests. The big missing piece is that con connectivity between the things that they're into, the social relationships they find meaningful, and our world, those sites of power that open doors to opportunity. And we have examples of highly resourceful young people like Dave who are able to self-advocate and market and really push to have their interests made visible and relevant. Like we have an example of a young fan fiction writer who uh, submitted the work for college essays. You know, we have examples of resourceful young people like that. But the thing that seems to make the biggest difference in filling in that last circle <coughs> is when they have a mentor, a teacher, a faculty member who's able to say, oh, you're into writing. Why don't you write for the school newspaper? Or why don't you take what you're doing at school and find an interest, community, or pursuit in a space outside of school? And those experiences are absolutely transformative for people. Uh, you know, the reality is that young people don't have these supports for the most part. So when we look at the data around the kids who are achieving connected learning through technology, it really is those passionate, interest-driven learners. I mean, they're doing great. This is like a kid in a candy shop for those kinds of highly self-motivated kids. The issue is most kids aren't like that. They come into interest through friendships. They come into interest because parents are kind of pushing them a little bit. They come into interest and passions because they have a mentor or faculty member who inspires them. Most kids don't wake up in the morning and think I'm gonna be a gymnast. These things are cultivated over time and require a lot of guidance and support. Now where this gets really, really important is when you put the equity issues on the table. So I think most of you are aware of sort of the demographic and stats around higher educational attainment where you know more people are going to college across all uh, socioeconomic divides. Now, of course, the richer folks, that's that line up top, the top income quintile, they are going to college and completing at higher rates than the less privileged kids. So the gap is widening, even though everybody is tending to go to college more. Now, what doesn't get talked about as much is this last graph, which is the expenditures on out-of-school enrichment activities, which for the richest families has tripled since the 70s. So now the wealthiest quarter of families spend about $8,000 a year on out-of-school enrichment, whereas the poor families, you know, it's not, and the research shows it's not because less privileged families don't value these experiences, right, whether it's <laughs> athletics or, creative arts and so on, it's just the economics of it are really, really rough, right? And especially so in a period when you've been seeing cutbacks in the public provisioning of these kind of uh, interest-driven or enrichment activities. Now, just like the Gallup poll shows, I think that what you're seeing is that privileged families, or all families, realize the importance of young people having these experiences that are about connecting with a mentor, an expert, and something you really care about. Having that relationship with a faculty member, being able to perform or compete in public, to have a sense that you are making a meaningful contribution to culture and society, uh, of having that strong handshake, of having that identity of somebody who's really good at something, 
We all know intuitively that these are experiences that really matter to young people. The numbers, whether it's the actual expenditures that families are making or something like the Gallup poll, is really showing that this is the equity gap we really need to be paying more attention to. So the question on the table, I think, is whether today's new technologies can help us in giving these experiences to more young people. Uh, and my belief is yes, but it really requires being intentional and thoughtful uh, and super proactive about the ways in which we make our investments around these new opportunities. And so uh, I want to talk about just a few uh, guiding principles. You know, again, this is all work in progress that we've been using in our work on connected learning to think about where we should be focusing our interventions and designs. And, uh, you know, we're trying to gather uh, examples of efforts uh, that we think are really productive in this area. So the first principle uh, is of tapping the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And this is really what the internet has taught us, uh, that uh, everybody is potentially a teacher and learner. And that exchange of knowledge and that ability to uh, share and benefit from everybody's learning and expertise, not just you know, the professional or the expert in the field is a really interesting feature uh, of internet uh, culture. And it is also something that radically expands the possibility for educational uh, and interest-driven learning support for young people. So for example, I think of Q&A forums on the internet as one of the most underappreciated <laughs> educational technologies out there. It is just a miracle of modern day life that you can wake up in the morning and ask the internet a question. <laughs> and somebody out there has either asked that question already or there's, you know, is willing to jump in if it's an interesting enough one. So, you know, Stack Exchange is just one of many of these kinds of forums. They started as, you know, the geek coding stack where uh, coders would help each other troubleshoot. But now they have stacks in like a lot of different specialties. One of my favorite is English language usage where, uh, you know, punctuation geeks can get together and argue about stuff. Uh, so what is, how about in higher education? Uh, you know, there's so many great examples of faculty innovating in this area, but just a few that we've uh, had the benefit of working more closely with in our connected learning work. One example I really like is Phonar. It's a photo narrative course that's taught by Jonathan Worth at Coventry University. And it's anchored in a regular class, a uh, photography class that he teaches with a small group of students. But then he puts the lectures, the materials, and the assignments on the internet. And then he invites anybody to participate. And it's all just uh, there's nothing, I mean, it is fancy technology-wise, but not in a certain sense. It's basically a hashtag, right? So it doesn't matter if you're on Flickr or Tumblr or Instagram or whatever. As long as you hashtag Phonar and follow along with the assignments, you can be part of the class. And what's cool about it, because it's scaling, right? So he has, you know, thousands and thousands of people who participate, is that you get this virtuous cycle going of the peer-to-peer -peer learning where uh, the people on the internet are giving feedback and helping each other. And he does some work aggregating and commenting and elevating, but mostly he's just teaching his class and inviting others to follow along. Now, uh, DS106 is another example, taught by Jim Brew, of a digital storytelling class similar to Phonar. It's anchored in a real life class with local students. Uh, and then, but the challenges and everything, he just lets people participate. You can be on WordPress, you can just be tweeting things, whatever you want. Um, and then I guess it was last fall, he couldn't actually teach the class, but he said, internet, you teach it. Just teach headless DS 106. Uh, so I haven't asked him how that actually went, but that was kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, and then I, I like uh, FemTechNet, which is, I guess they call it a Duke, a distributed open online course. And this is uh, kind of cool because uh, a number of faculty who teach uh, feminist technology studies court sync up their schedules so they're teaching a similar course across multiple campuses. So then you get, uh, 
you know, this sort of, again, this virtuous cycle where you have a much larger pool of both faculty and young people with different kinds of interests and expertise, but kind of paying attention at the same time and a lot of exchange going on. So it's like, I know it's work to coordinate across campuses, but we all have networks of colleagues that teach similar things. It wouldn't be cool if you could get your colleague on the other side of the country to be teaching a class that your a uh, uh, lecture that your kids could also, you know, it's just, this is, the, this is the power of the peer to peer internet. Okay, so the other principle is meet learners where they are. Uh, and this is really the interest driven principle. And it's also just the idea that young people are immersed in these environments, so let's leverage them rather than, you know, see our job as policing those boundaries between the real learning and the, uh, the fun stuff. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting right now in the online ecosystem, which, you know, I've been doing research for 20 years from the early days when, you know, there were dungeons where kids would hack monsters and that's all about all that was happening for fun on the internet. And, you know, what used to be basically a space for, you know, a pretty narrow set of interests that were geeky and in nature has really, really radically expanded. So, you know, we're doing case studies of, you know, uh, fiber arts, knitting and crocheters mobilized on the internet and uh, you know we're looking at wrestling fans, we're looking at you know boy band fans and there's so many interests for every possible group now that there's really no reason why uh, there shouldn't be some connection to areas that we all uh, are specializing in as faculty. Now how you do this, you know, again this has to be tailored to the subject and your interests, your students' interests. I'll plug one example from my home institution, the Walking Dead MOOC. So there's stuff happening in the world that your students are into. And is there any way you can recontextualize, reframe that, leverage that in ways that advance uh, the agendas of your uh, subject and class? Here's another, it doesn't have to be pop culture. So here's another example of uh, a faculty member at the University of North Carolina uh, School of the Arts, Joe Mills, and he did something really simple, which is he teaches a writing class, and one semester he s decided that not only would his kids blog instead of writing traditional essays, but they blog about something they're involved in. So if they're a bouncer at a nightclub, they're blogging about bouncing. If they're starting a gluten-free diet, they're blogging about their gluten-free diet. And he said that, you know, the quality of the writing improved so dramatically with this simple shift that, you know, this is, it, it, in other words, it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just where are, how can you connect with their lives outside of the classroom? Uh, it's a pretty basic question. Uh, another thing we've been looking at is just, again, going back to the Gallup work, this idea that project-based work there's really no reason why it has to be sequestered within the format of a 10-week class, for example. And what are the ways in which we can start thinking about project work and, and places for project work and communities and relationships for meaningful project work that's anchored within our institutions of higher education but also have this more sustained life and so the maker space or the tinkering space, whatever you want to call it, movement is really interesting in that respect. You know, from the research, we know that geeks don't just spring fully form from the internet. They have <laughs> groups, they have their people they hang out with and they have their places, like computer labs, which are the places that signify those social relationships, those places for tinkering, hacking and experimenting and sharing that really are there as a persistent strand within a young person's development and identity. And the development of like a hacker identity and set of competencies can't really happen in these sequestered or you know, clearly sequenced kinds of ways. They're developed in the context of these relationships and places. And that's why we know that young people who tend to have very innovative kind of hacker tech oriented sensibilities are either in environments where they have a peer group like this or in families that support that. So how can our universities, like this is a big equity issue, right? It's like if you don't have the social capital, you're not gonna get there. And that social capital, the cultural capital identity piece is so fundamental. Now, 
That's why I think some of the movements within college and university settings to create maker spaces is really interesting. You know, it's not like this is a new model again. Um, it's studio-based learning that we've had in a lot of design and architecture-like type specialties for quite some time. But I think the new digital tools are opening up a different kind of opportunity space and also broadening the range of young people and interests that might identify with something like a tinkering or making or hacking space. Um, <coughs> with teenagers, with high school kids, uh, with the MacArthur work, we've been uh, supporting the development of a network of learning labs around the country and libraries and museums where kids can drop in, hang out, uh, have tools, but also and access to peers that share the interest, but also uh, mentors and their specialties and area of interest that are there to help guide and support uh, young people. So this has been a lot of fun. Uh, and then finally, um, I wanted to, uh, again, on this theme of building connections between what's happening in the classroom and the world at large, is this issue of uh, recognition or what we call in formal context assessment or credentialing. Like how do you get things that happen inside and outside of the classroom to be speaking to each other visible to really be marking what kids are learning and knowing and ways that open up opportunity and signal the right things in the right ways. Um, the uh, experiments we've been doing like at the U Media Lab the library space in the Chicago Public Library have been really interesting in this respect because as those of us who create learning environments, we're creating these environments where often kids are making really neat stuff. Uh, and then the, the big additional piece that I think uh, we're experimenting with because the digital world offers this new space of publicity and sharing is what does it look like when we push those products out to the wider world and get recognized now this can take the form of, you know, like in the spoken word module, uh, the mentors support the young people in entering competitions. Uh, I think one of the reasons why athletics is so successful as uh, interest-driven activity that's community supported is because there's these natural spaces of recognition and celebration and markers of achievement that are very public and porous to the community. So you get a tremendous amount of buy-in from parents and community, even though when you really look at athletics for most kids, it's not like these kids, for the most part, are gonna become major league players or you know, join the NFL or something, but we see a value in marking young people's achievements and publicity in ways. And I think <coughs> as educators, we often don't do enough to just make those achievements visible uh, to a broader public, and the internet is really game-changing that way. So just as one example, there's a group of gamer kids who hang out at the library space. Uh, one of the librarians got them to start uh, doing a podcast, a game review podcast. They put it on the internet, and they have an audience. I mean, it's not a huge audience, but it's so cool. Like, it's transformative for them to have that experience of doing something that provides value to others. And uh, you know, even a little bit goes a long way. Now, there's also all this stuff that's happening around alternative credentialing and so on. Uh, so uh, you know, LinkedIn is making a big move into the badging and skills space, especially in fields like tech, like you saw with the example with Dave, that our formal educational institutions tend not to be able to keep up as quickly as the innovation cycle. So you're seeing all these commercial alternatives or these self-study kinds of things popping up to fill a gap. And so there has to be ways for young people to have those skills recognized. Now, this is a multi-directional thing, right? So you know, if a kid has learned photography through the open online course Phonar, is that going to get them out of the prerequisite here when they start college? You know, it's these kinds of things that we're really needing to sort out because the learning is happening in a lot of different places. And you don't want to go on the assumption that the learning is only happening within the time, space sequence of a traditional uh, accredited course. So we have been partnering with the Mozilla Foundation in developing an open badging infrastructure uh, that has been rolled out uh, citywide in Chicago and is, you know, more and more cities are adopting badging systems to 
uh, start taking into account the kind of learning that young people are doing in after school clubs, during summer programs, and so on, because we've never really had a system or an infrastructure to make that learning visible across institutions and in these more informal learning spaces. Now, it's still very early days, but it's clear that these are the sorts of solutions that need to be in the ecosystem of innovation. And I would particularly impress on all of us who are in institutions of higher education to consider the kinds of downward pressures that college admissions plays in the sort of, you know, accumulation of goodies that kids are trying to develop during their careers in high school. Uh, and what gets counted, what becomes visible uh, as kids move through the system. Now the same thing is true on the employer end, right? That we're starting to realize that those traditional signals or markers of whether a kid can do something or has accomplished something are maybe not the best metrics. Uh, so I think it's very interesting times, ways to experiment. You know, I think the open online courses are a bit of a wedge in this conversation too. So how does credentialing happen when you know the same kid could take this course, basically maybe have some of the out same outcomes from a knowledge and skills perspective, but you know maybe not have those experiences that you know are about connecting with faculty or having a meaningful project. Those things aren't necessarily measured in a lot of the metrics that we've been looking at. So. Uh, you know, there's these design principles, you know, maker spaces, meeting kids where they are, uh, tapping peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, you know, considering alternative forms of recognition and credentialing. These are all examples of design principles that are works in progress, uh, where we're trying to develop the connected learning model, not only as a description of highly successful learners, but as a model of intervention, of uh, pedagogy of design uh, that can really uh, work to make these forms of meaningful learning available to many, many more young people. And this really isn't going to happen without uh, the involvement and buy-in from uh, educators in a lot of different institutions. This is a cross-sector problem, which is what makes it uh, both interesting and challenging. Uh, you know, connected learning isn't about a particular technology or technique. It's really about reconnecting with what we've always known to be good uh, teaching and learning uh, educational experiences. Now, the bad news is also that it's not about a particular technology or technique. So you can't say, just adopt this and the learning will happen. It really has to be shaped by the subject, the teacher, the student population. Uh, but the, you know, the, the promising thing is that there really is a growing movement among educators around the country uh, to provide exactly these kinds of meaningful, interest-driven, and socially connected kinds of learning uh, institutions. And there's so much that we can all do right now. Uh, it doesn't have to involve overhauling the library and making it into a makerspace or starting a brand new school, but it can be something as simple as you know, changing the writing assignment, uh, having young people publish stuff on the open web, uh, encouraging peer interaction on a new platform like you have with Canvas. These are all things that are super accessible. They may seem like small or incremental changes on the part of the institution. It's not about, you know, throwing out higher ed as we know it. Uh, it's not even maybe about changing your, the structure of your class even that much. But the thing to remember is that what may seem incremental or off in the margins from your own educational practice can be life-changing for young people. So if you go back to the findings that, oh, being really involved in an interest and an extracurricular activity, that is life-changing. Even though from the point of view of an instructor, faculty advisor, it may not seem like that big a deal, the thing with connected and interest-driven learning is that these are the things that are at the center of young people's lives. Now, they have to do a whole lot of other things, too. But this is the learning that makes them feel most connected, that they identify with, that they really want support for. So even if it's a small change on the part of an educational institution for an educator, it can be a totally transformative experience uh, for young people. So, we have just launched 
last month, a new alliance for connected learning that represents a growing movement of organizations, of projects that are really uh, trying to work together and across traditional boundaries that have separated libraries, museums, colleges, universities, schools, the entertainment sector, and so on, to try to support a more equitable distribution of these kinds of meaningful learning opportunities and trying to understand how technology can really be a support for that rather than something that creates growing inequity, which is unfortunately historically how these things have played out in the past. So there's a ton of resources. Uh, I would really love to learn from your experiences uh, and all the innovations that it sounds like you have been involved in. Uh, I think we have a time for a few questions. Is that true? Yeah. Thank you. talk about connected educators and so on happening in professional practice. And uh, I do think that one of the challenges with connected learning approaches is that the way that you evaluate outcomes is going to look different. So that, you know, what you're seeing, like when you're supporting environments that are more interest driven, I mean, again, it depends, you know, it's really hard to uh, measure from traditional skills and knowledge based metrics in quite the same way. Like, so we have a drop-in space, like the Harold Washington Library. Kids come in. Half the kids are just sitting around with their laptops on Facebook, just doing the social connection thing. And then there's a small number of kids who are doing really geeked out, like high-end production. Now, it's tempting to say, oh, so those kids, the hangout kids, are like, they're just sharing. Like, there's not a lot of quality or content. But I think it's important to realize that the interest development happens over a long period of time and includes multiple components. And that sort of identity and belonging, just the fact that they have a safe space to hang out with others, feel like they can belong, kind of be like a learner and interested uh, and feel a connection. Uh, that social connection and identity piece is actually really, really important. So I think with your educators or principals, that would be the question to ask is, there may be other outcomes. So we, for example, measure social capital outcomes as a really important outcome that's agnostic as to the skills and knowledge metrics. So we measure things like have young people uh, connected with another peer who shares their interests and have they connected with an adult who shares the interest. And these are examples of things that are less quantifiable in terms of traditional outcome metrics, but we think are really, really important for the longer term sort of social well-being type, type outcomes. So it's a bit about changing the outcomes conversation too. Yeah. Hi. Um, have you come across some examples of using connected learning to get students um, excited about solving problems in society? Now some of your examples yeah. are about discovering their own passion, right, right, kind right. of looking in. Yeah. Um, have you come across some where they get kind of inspired to say there's this pro there's a water shortage yeah. or there's a housing shortage or you know yeah. getting getting yeah. involved in problems? Absolutely. Problem no, problems. thank you for bringing that up. We actually like I run a research network on collected connected learning for MacArthur, but we have a whole other network which is on uh, youth and participatory politics, which is looking at the civic and political dimensions. So yes, absolutely. I mean, we talk about outcomes in terms of civic, career, and economic, like three parts. And I think it's a really important reminder, and I th thank you for bringing that up, that the connect connection to communities and shared purposes that are civic in nature are really, really critical and just as life-changing and transformative and contributing to that sense of purpose and meaning as you know, becoming a web comics artist or something that's more about the career advancement side of things. So, yeah, some examples of case studies like 
Uh, the Harry Potter Alliance is one of my favorites. So Harry Potter fans mobilize for social good. They run a ton of campaigns. They call themselves Dumbledore's Army. You know, again, it's about this recontextualization of young people's interests in terms of the outcomes we care about. Uh, you know, another, we've looked at the dream, dream activists, you know, who are another really great example of digitally mobilized uh, communities, but also just a lot of work in, you know, what you think of as the positive youth development or uh, space around uh, community engagement. And, you know, that's less of a technology mediated thing, but, uh, you know, definitely would, I mean, connecting and learning doesn't have to be technology leverage. You know, that's also a huge part of it. Yeah. A lot of what you presented, I think, is quite relevant to the younger learners. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested to see how you might apply it to those students that want encounters in graduate school or professional school. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, our my work is definitely focused on the teen segment, but I would imagine, you know, just like the question with the connected principles and so on, that you know, we like our educators that we work with and you know, graduate students that we're actually mentoring with, you know, we've been experimenting with how uh, these kinds of uh, models and approaches work. And uh, part of the issue, I think, with professional development is that it tends to be less sequestered already than what we do with the younger kids and that they are sort of on doing more of those practicums and you know, on the job or how we think about it, kinds of experiences which we do with our graduate students already. So my, you know, it, it's, you know, I think there's sort of particularities to K-12 and to some degree college experiences that have kept those experiences a little bit more sequestered than ideally what I would imagine a graduate education would look like, if that makes sense. <coughs> Yeah, so I, gender is a huge differentiator in overall patterns for technology use. And if I was going to be, you know, the most simplistic kind of dichotomy is that girls tend to lead on the social uses and boys lead on the geeked out uses. So if you look at, like, say, text messaging or social stuff on Facebook skews towards girls, but if you look at something like you know, Warcraft modding or, you know, a game like Starcraft, which is really intense and competitive and expertise driven, I'll put that in quotes, like culturally signaled as expertise driven. Those are overwhelmingly boys. One of my postdocs did a study of, uh, yeah, World of Warcraft modding. We also looked at Starcraft and, yeah, the gender imbalance is really, really stark. So even when you talk about gaming, Social and casual gaming is girl dominated, but these much more intense practices are very boy dominated. And not only boys, but you know, there's also racial and ethnic patterns that emerge. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of that. I think on the positive side of things that if you really dig into the practices, girls are actually doing really geeked out things. They just might not want to label it that way. So, you know, we've been proactively looking at uh, online communities that are girl dominated that have really intense expertise orientations. And you know, I think culturally we have to kind of get around our bias around girl culture. So like when I talk about boy band interests, like that's the one thing that will get the, the eye rolls among the educators. But you know, we did a whole case, you know, one of um, our graduate students did a case study of One Direction fan fiction. And it's just amazing what the girls are doing in terms of their learning and development. So you know, it's. Like, it's cool to be on Minecraft now in the educator world, but it's not cool to be like a screaming fangirl and into that. So there's a lot of, you know, cultural distinctions. The nature of the interest really inflects how educators engage with that interest. So it's, I think it's really important to be aware of. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In your research, have you seen um, such things as being too connected? 
Yeah, no, I, I think it's actually endemic to what it's like to be immersed in these environments. So I, I didn't talk about it much, but there is a whole strand of the work that is about, you know, cultivating dispositions for attention management and, uh, you know, mindfulness and a lot of other things about making wise learning choices. Uh, a lot of dispositions that were not, you know, even as a parent, I struggle every day, like, there's so much opportunity out there. It's really about making wise choices about where to focus. It's not about access to the opportunities per se. Kids are inundated with invitations to do cool stuff. So I think it's a really, it's a really important issue and I think something that, uh, you know, as parents and educators, we need to have a lot more dialogue about. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.